Hi everybody, I'm Troy Graham. I'm uh, here filming for Rivertop Tapes. This first song is I Didn't See You Coming Down the Road. I didn't see you coming down the road No, I didn't see you coming down the road If I spent so much time being drunk beneath the pines That I didn't see you coming down the road I don't want to see your face no more I don't want to see your face no more I remember being younger You were knocking at my door I don't want to see your face no more Cause I found me a lover that's pure and true I found me a lover so pure and true the best thing I ever did was losing track of you Cause I found me lover so pure and true And I don't know which way I've gone back home And I want to tell you I'm beside the telephone If I never saw the way that you've gone back how could I be the one who lost his track? my candle in the dark She is my candle in the dark Well I know that if she's the flame then I'll always be the spark Oh now she is my candle in the dark I've been sober now for you I've been sober now for years Turns out all that drinking never did was make me cry tears Cause I've been sober now for years And I didn't see you coming down the road No, I didn't see you coming down the road I got into music when I was a young child. I was like four years old. My dad sang in a church choir and I went to that. And then uh, one day I just sang like one of the songs they were doing and everybody there like realized like, oh, this kid can sing. Like we should, you know, you should continue to do that. And so then I did and I just, I loved it. I loved like being in front of people. I loved entertaining people. I loved that it wasn't math or science or you know, any of that kind of stuff. I loved that it was artistic expression and I loved that I didn't have to have a reason to be weird, you know. The first time that I ever made up a song of my own, I was like 15 and uh, it was a song, I mean, just a gar, you know, and I think about it now, it's just a pile of garbage, the song, but it was like one of those things where, you know, you pull out your guitar and you play the few chords that you do know and you, you're like ready to conquer the world, you know, because I know three chords and ah, and, I just uh, 
went ahead and did that and I wrote the song and now I would never, ever, 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 ever play that song or admit that I even wrote the song to anybody <laughs> really. But it was, at the time, it was a big groundbreaking step, you know, to be like, I can do this. I created this. I'm going to continue to create things like this. And Hate. Hate is a waste of time. Hate can be over a nickel or a dime. Hate is a dark passion and can influence people's hearts and minds. Hate is anger mixed with regret, but hate is the worst hate crime that I've seen yet. When I graduated high school, I already had a band and I was playing bass and, you know, we were actually touring at that point already, you know, like my summer after my high school, my senior year of high school, I worked for a few weeks as a dishwasher and that was not for me and um, toured, you know, just was like, nope, I'm going to do music, you know, and it was kind of one of those things where it was like, I'm either going to eat playing music or I'm not going to eat, you know, and you force yourself into that position, uncomfortable position where a lot of times you find yourself on the street corner just playing your guitar for whatever tips people feel like giving you. But if it's 10 bucks, you know, and you can go buy a sandwich, that's your sandwich that you earned, you know, because somebody cared enough to drop $10 or 10 people or whoever, however you got the $10 in your tip jar, you know, they cared enough to do that and you worked hard enough to get that. You know what I mean? On your own terms, you didn't follow anyone else's rules, you did your own thing, you know? Because at that time, when I was right after high school, I was couch surfing a lot, so I'd play my guitar for a couple hours and I, I didn't just make 10 bucks. I mean, I, there was times where I was making 100 bucks a day just sitting on the street corner, you know, two or three hours, just $100 during the peak of tourist season in Marquette, make 100 bucks, go get a sandwich, rent a couple movies and go back to whatever house I'm staying at. Or, you know, I mean, I had my, I was living with my dad part-time too at that point and, you know, go back there or whatever and go back down to the street corner again the next day. I mean, it was just, at first it was like, that's how gigs start, right? And then people see you and that, oh, hey, I'm doing this house party or I'm doing this show here, you know, whatever. And, you know, but the one thing that I never did, unless it was like a charity event, like I'll always play a charity event. I'll always do like a cancer benefit or things like that for free. But other than that type of event, I never played for free. Because as soon as you play for free, people are going to expect that, you know? So there were times where I was like, well, I can't do it for free, but I can do it for 25 bucks. You know, I mean, even that little amount, because it's still valuing my time at more than nothing. And I think the struggle is 90% of it. You know, I mean, you, you don't, <laughs> like you don't put steel strings on a piece of wood and travel around the country and hope that those steel strings and that piece of wood pay your bills unless you're a little bit of a, interesting person in the first place you know what I mean like to actually go and do that without any safety net you know what I mean I never went to college except for a very short term I was an acting student but you know then when I realized that I wasn't going to be Batman for a living you know it's like I had to like take a step back and be like okay like I don't have the money to go to college I don't have it like how can I make a, a living but not just pay my bills make a comfortable living but at the same time, I don't want to wash dishes or I don't want to do retail or I don't want to, you know, whatever, because that, that, those type of jobs are just the type of jobs that will actually drive you insane after a while. You know what I mean? So like, I was like, well, I'm going to play this guitar and this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to play my bass and I'm going to write poetry and any chance that I get anywhere, if there's an opportunity for me to play this guitar, I mean, I, I had a little backpack soft case. And I had that thing on all the time. And if, I mean, I remember there was one time in Marquette, there was this guy in front of a liquor store who just saw me walking down the street, wasn't from Marquette. And he was like, hey, you know, you play music. And I was like, yeah, you know, whatever, I dabble. You know, I mostly write my own stuff. And he's like, well, play me one of your original songs right now and I'll give you some money. And I was like, okay, cool. So I played him like three or four of my songs, like just standing in front of this liquor store. And by the time I was done, there was 15 people standing there watching me, you know, and that guy gave me 50 bucks. And then everybody else was like, you know, 
throwing money in my little soft case and whatever, and I just zip it up and off I'd go down to the beach or whatever. And but 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 what I realized in that specific instant is I was like 19 years old when that happened, right? And I was like, I just made a hundred dollars in 15 minutes. And I always had these like I this first five track little CD I had out, right? Like I'd I'd have those with me everywhere little plastic sleeve, black and white, just terrible artwork, right? But it was my, but it was mine. You know, it was my music that I was selling to people. And people see that, they'd be like, oh, that's cool. I'll take one for five bucks. You know, I sell them for five bucks. And I think out of those 15 people that were standing there, like, you know, every person was throwing like a, a $1 bill or a $5 bill in. And the one guy gave me 50 bucks because he was just a traveler and, you know, wanted to hear some original songs, I guess. I don't know. I didn't ask too many questions, but, <laughs> you know. And just about everybody there bought a CD too for like five bucks. And I was like, wow, like this is completely doable. Like this is 100% doable. The, pr the hard part of that is balancing that with not being too pushy. Like you can't, like yes, you have to be persistent with places that you want to play or be persistent with people, but there is a right time to play music and there is a wrong time to play music. You know what I mean? Like there's socially you know, events that socially you just shouldn't bust out your guitar and start playing during this speech that somebody's giving at a public format or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, because that's just rude, you know? And so I kind of always minded my P's and Q's with that. I was like, is this the right time to really play or is it not? Or, you know, and we have a park in Marquette called Harlow Park. And I would, it's right across the street from our dominoes. And I used to spend hours down there just playing the guitar for whoever would walk by and people, oh, you know, that's cool. And if one person sits there and listens to a couple songs, that's better than nobody, you know, and that's the mentality you have to have. And then when I got like to the point where I was actually getting paid to do gigs, whether it was in bars or libraries or coffee shops or whatever, if there was one person there, that's one person that I want as my fan, that I want to sell my CD or my book to, you know, and so I better play the best I've ever played in my life to make that person who looks like they're bored out of their mind drinking their ice mochaccino want whatever I have to offer them. So a lot of it has to do with being hungry. And the moment you lose that hunger, that's when you gotta stop. You know, because I'm in my mid thirties now and like I'm still like every day just like, how can I do this better? How can I make better money? How can I get to bigger venues? How can I? And yeah, there is a lot of, you know, rubbing elbows and schmoozing and talking to the right people and, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's if you get that opportunity, you better be able to play. You know what I mean? You better get up there and you better show them like, this is why you need to book me. Like, and pay me. Next song is called Father Time. I 
saw you on that hill Yes, I saw you up on that hill And with all your devilish smiles I know you've been dressed to kill Oh, I saw you on that hill Holding hands with Father Time Holding hands with Father Time Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm doing Next song is called Foolish. Sober October. One more sober October, seeing the leaves fall off the trees and feeling the bitter wind coming in from the north. One more sober October. And I see all the people of the world dealing with their problems through alcohol and drugs. One more sober October, swimming with freshwater mermaids in the largest body of fresh water there has ever been. One more sober October, being able to see clearly what is right and what is wrong Maybe next October I'll be sober, or maybe I'll be gone. Cat. Cat chasing a ball of yarn never did me no harm. Cat is content sitting in the window watching cars. Cat never did me no harm. Cat likes to eat, sleep, and play all day. Seems to me like cats are much like people, just less in the way. Bells. The bells that ring at the start of a wedding are the same as the bells that ring at the start of a funeral. So here I am at your wedding and all I can think of is death. With the poetry, um, I was writing songs, right? But I had too many song, too many words to write, put into songs. And so I was like, oh, you know, I should probably just, uh, maybe write some poems down. And, you know, we had uh, a couple of local people in Marquette who were doing these zine, zine projects, which are like, you know, little paper zines that they put out. And 
you know, whatever. And this one girl was like, well, hey, I'll put some of your poems in there and, you know, whatever. And I was like, cool. So like I put, uh, I think it was three poems in one of them and people like flipped. They were like, this is incredible work. And my poems, like if you read my poetry book, uh, my new one, Freshwater Mermaid, I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty short poems. Like there's not a lot of words to them, but they say a lot in a very little amount of words, you know? So that's that. And um, yeah, I just remember like being like, well, I have more to express than just the songs I write. Right. And if I don't, I'm going to go nuts. So just started writing poetry. And I, I started, uh, I co-founded a uh, publishing company out of Marquette called uh, Pyre Publishing, which um, on paper, the owner of that is uh, this girl named Aileen Bloomer. And then I was just kind of like the events coordinator and stuff for that for a while. And, um, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't work with them anymore, but it was great. I did three books uh, with them and had my poetry in three different books and all that. And that was like an, a new like experience though, because it was like, oh, hey, I can already play songs. Maybe I can call these libraries and hey, we'll do a writing workshop and I'll give you uh, an hour of music for this amount of money, right? So then I remember the first time I was able to take poets with me on tour who did not play music. They did poetry only, right? And they were getting paid $100 a show to read their poetry. And I was making what I made doing the po a little poetry and music, right? And it was like, I just remember thinking, this is a miracle that we are in like 2015 and we're getting paid to read our poetry. Somebody cares enough about what we're doing that we are getting paid to read words that we wrote out of our own heads. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was just kind of a surreal thing. Like, and the libraries didn't even blink an eye at it because obviously libraries have poetry sections and are big fans of like, you know, the times where there would be the coffee houses would be overflown before there was any social media or any cell phones or any distractions like that where people would just come and listen to these poets speak. And, you know, and, and I felt like that was, that was a time again, you know, because we would go all over, primarily in this area, you know, I mean, we did like Ross Commons, St. Ignis, you know, places like that and Lake City, you know, and uh, we were doing all these libraries and these people were like intently listening like intently listening to what we were doing. And then like after the show, we'd sell five or six books and like every library would buy a book and, you know, put it in their archives. And it, it, it was just like, this is insane that like we're getting paid to be poets. Like I just remember being like, we're being paid to be poets. Like this is ridiculous. Like I must have missed this day at career day in school, you know, where it's like, you can be paid to be a poet and a musician and make a living doing it. it was like that was never an option. You know what I mean? And so basically what I'm trying to get at with the whole generalization of everything that we've talked about today is if you want to be an artist, you can. It's just a certain level of discipline, a certain level of persistency, but also a certain level of knowing when to kind of go back and, you know, and you have to be flexible sometimes with your pricing and because not everybody can pay you what you want. And sometimes you got to take less to get more jobs. You know what I mean? And all that kind of stuff, but it is absolutely a way of life and you can do it. I love you. I love you in the way the shadow loves the light. I love you in the same way that the darkness loves the night. I need you the way that the wind needs a kite. I love you more and more each day. I know that this is right. I need you like the flower needs the ground there is so much love in our hearts, I can feel it all around. Day has come and night will pass. The one thing I truly believe is that our love surely will last for my wife. Next song is called When I Was a Younger Man. Oh, 
done and I fell in love real hard I've been all around this world just playing my guitar I fell in love real hard So this is my new book here. It's called Freshwater Mermaids. Um, it's a collection of poetry and prose. A couple short stories in there. Um, as you can see, the artwork's really great. It's done by a local friend of mine. Uh, he lives in Munising. His name is Sean Wolfman. Um, here's a lot of the poems here. This is available um, on Amazon. Actually, is distributing it right now. It's on uh, Kindle. Uh, you can get it on Kindle or just go on Amazon.com. Type in Freshwater Mermaids. I don't know if you guys can see the title right there. Trigram Freshwater Mermaids. Um, and it'll pop right up. And if you're interested in purchasing a copy, you can get it right on Amazon, very accessible, very easy to find it. Um, or if you come to one of the shows that I do or a poetry reading that I do or whatever, I'll, I'll have copies there that you can buy and I'll autograph them for you or whatever, if that's of any interest to you or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, 2022 is gonna be nuts. I mean, as long as the COVID thing is not, you know, shutting everything down again. Um, I plan to go to Vermont. I plan to go to Maine um, to really kind of get out on the eastern part of the United States a little bit more. Um, and, and I'm just going to, you know, I'm really going to hit the libraries. I'm going to hit them hard. And I'm going to try to read my poems to everybody around the country. And, and, and also, but do the creative writing workshops. Because the great thing about creative writing workshops is, you know, if you get people to come to those, it's all about, it's all about vulnerability, right? You can't be an artist of any kind, whether you're a filmmaker, an actor, painter, musician, whatever, unless you're vulnerable to some extent. Like you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable to be an artist, right? Because there's no way you're going to tell me that the most famous movie stars has ever not been uncomfortable doing a scene. You know, there's stuff in this book that I wrote and I was like, oh boy, you know, like, but you put it out there because you have to allow yourself to be at the judgment of other people. And you have to, I mean, you have to in order to be an artist because people, first of all, most of the time respect that you do it. Secondly, if they don't like your stuff, then that's up to them. But, you know, you still put it out there for your own well, well-being and your peace of mind and stuff like that. And I just think that, you know, doing writing workshops, especially at, I mean, I've, I've been, I've gone into schools, like a high sc uh, middle school, high school, where I'll like run their, their English class for the day, you know, and have these students, and man, some of the stuff these students write, like it's obvious that they got stuff going on, and they need to get it out somewhere, and they didn't have this outlet 
until I kind of came in there and gave them the permission to write this down. Like you, it's okay to write this down. And if you want to read it, I'll listen to it and I won't judge you. You know what I mean? That's important. But the great thing about it is that some of these schools that I'd go to and do this, I mean, I had kids tackle some serious topics. I mean, some serious topics that even like the, the teachers would come up to me afterwards and be like, dude, we didn't know that. Like, we're definitely going to like follow up with that and like see if we can help them or, you know, whatever. And, and that's what it's all about. That kind of vulnerability is real art. That's art in the purest form where you're laying in a loft somewhere and you have no money to your name and doggone it, you have to get this, this thing that you're experiencing right now, this laying in a loft and you have no money to your name. I have to write down that, that, I, that my only friend right now is the pipes you know, running water through the upstairs for the person who's taking a shower. And that's, that's the only sound I've heard in 12 hours. To write that on a piece of paper and have somebody read that and be like, oh man, I've been homeless too. Like I've been real down on my luck too. And I've, and I've had to create stories of what I think the person who's running the water upstairs is going to do just because I'm going to lose my mind if I don't think of something to do. You know what I mean? And then you write it down. And then people read it and they say, wow, okay. Like my life isn't the only life that's hard. But it's that point of admitting, like for me, a lot of my writing is about my alcoholism, right? And it's like, I had to tackle that. Yeah, I was a drunk. I was a miserable drunk and it's uncomfortable and it's not fun and there's nothing glamorous about it, but I wrote it down and I'm honest about it. And some people are like a little uncomfortable when they read some of the stuff that I experienced while I was drinking and, you know, that those points in my life or whatever. But a lot of people are like, I really respect that you put that down, you know? And it's that vulnerability that I have as an artist and as a writer where I'll just put it out there. And if you want to hear it, great. If it means nothing to you, that's fine. But, you know, maybe this person over here was having a real bad day and, and that helped their day, you know? And I also like to do this thing called... Um, in my workshops, I, I like to do this thing called letter to a stranger, you know, where you just sit down and you write a letter to a stranger, someone you've never met before in your life, you know, and maybe who you are, maybe just, oh, you know, I'm sitting under a tree right now or whatever's happening. And then you just walk up to somebody you've never seen before in your life and you hand it to them. And then you walk away because maybe that person just lost their job or maybe that person just separated from their husband or wife, or maybe that person you know, is considering taking their own life. And maybe that letter from a stranger will save them. This the last song I'm going to do here today. It's called Lost and Found. Thank you so much. I'm Troy Graham. and founds where you can find my brain next to a pair of shoes and a bicycle chain in the lost and founds where you can find my heart as it always been there from the start and the lost and found is where I look when I can't find my answers in a book and the lost and found is what I hold on to when I'm sick and tired of hiding from
Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good day.